By the 11th century, what we now call Great Britain had come under attack from Scandinavian raiders who called themselves Vikings. Some of the more ambitious kings of Denmark wanted to take the crown of England. Those in the house of Alfred the Great tried to stop them, but eventually Swine Forkbeard and his son Canute the Great both succeeded. In Scotland, succession crises made the country vulnerable for attacks from Vikings who surrounded them on all sides. Using an ancient system of appointed heirs called Tanistry, the rivals for the crown were always trying to kill each other. Malcolm had killed King Kenneth III and became Malcolm II, the High King of Scotland. He had no sons who could succeed him, but he had daughters, which he married off to influential people and enemies. Each of them had sons. Bethok had Duncan, Doeda had Macbeth, and Plantula had Thorfinn. After Thorfinn and Macbeth's fathers were killed, they went to live with their grandfather, King Malcolm II, and were raised at his court with Duncan, who was fostered there. Malcolm killed all his rivals and, much to the shock and surprise of everyone, changed the ancient succession system of Tanistry to primogeniture, a European hereditary system which transfers the crown from father to son. When Malcolm was ambushed and killed by family members of his murdered rivals, it was Duncan, Malcolm's grandson by his firstborn, who became the new king. The new system blocked Malcolm's other grandsons, Macbeth and Thorfinn, from getting the crown. Duncan, however, was not considered kingly material, and his military skill was questionable. Kings of Scotland had to be warriors to defend the land and its people against its enemies, and an incompetent king was a threat to the Scottish people. In the past, thrones in Scotland were often seized by force. It would only be a matter of time before one of his cousins, both capable war leaders, made a move. Duncan had to move first. One chronicler said, Nothing worthy of mention happened in the kingdom during this short time of Duncan's reign. Well, that's not true. As you may remember, medieval kings often wanted to prove their military prowess by leading a hosting as soon as they could after they were crowned, the Krechrig. A man referred to in the Orkneyinga saga as Karl Hunason, or the King of Scots, attempted to reassert control over Viking-held Caithness. Karl Hunason, or Son of a Dog, was not the man's real name. It was a slur. This Karl appointed his nephew Mudan as Mormer of Caithness, but Thorfinn the Mighty, who had been given rule over the province by his grandfather, King Malcolm II, naturally refused to pay any tribute for it. Thorfinn's brother Brusi had died at this point, and he had become the sole ruler of the Orkney earldom. He was the Jarl of the Orkneys as a vassal of the King of Norway, and as a Jarl of Caithness responsible to the King of Scots. This was Thorfinn's description. He was unusually tall and strong, an ugly-looking man with a black head of hair, sharp features, a big nose, and bushy eyebrows. He was a mighty man of strife and greedy both of money and honor. He was lucky in battle and skillful in war and good in onslaught. So good luck to anyone trying to fight him. To enforce the collection of tribute, Mudan raised an army and advanced into Caithness, but withdrew when he ran into a superior Viking force. In the aftermath, Thorfinn got Sutherland and Ross to submit to him and plundered throughout Scotland. Well, that's what the saga claimed, but Thorfinn didn't go after the whole of Scotland. He would have run into his neighbor and cousin Macbeth, the Mormer of Murray, pretty quickly, and that man wouldn't have stood for it. The best guess is that the cousins made a deal and Thorfinn backed off. After Mudan told Karl all about his defeat, the son of a dog himself led eleven warships in a surprise attack on Thorfinn's fleet and Deerness. He was defeated. Karl's flagship was lost, but he escaped with a soaking. Hunason then raised an army from across Scotland, both in the east and the west, as far south as Kintyre, which also included Irish forces. At the same time, Thorfinn mustered all the troops from Caithness, Sutherland and Ross and advanced southward. Thorkel, Thorfinn's foster father, killed Mudan in Turso before joining up with Thorfinn and his army. The Viking and Scottish armies then clashed in a battle at Thorfness, or Tarbot Ness. Slim blade sang there south on Oikel's bank. Despite outnumbering his enemy, Karl's army was defeated. Well, the red weapons fed wolves at Thorfness. Karl fled in the field, although in the confusion of the battle, some saga tellers say he was killed. So who was this Karl Hunason? Duncan, Macbeth, 
someone else? The historians had a meeting and couldn't agree. I'm siding with those who said it was Duncan and not Macbeth. Check this line. The next man to take over power in Scotland was Carl Hunason. Duncan is never mentioned by name in the saga, but Macbeth is. They called him Magbeth. Other bits in the saga also clearly point at Duncan. Why did Duncan suddenly feel the urge to attack his cousin? Was he jealous of his grandfather's gift of Caithness to the son of a Viking, Scotland's enemy number one? Was it because he wanted to drive his cousin off the mainland and back to the island? Or was it because Thorfinn was a rival to the throne of Scotland? Alas, we do not know. Thorfinn's victory did leave Scotland exposed to Viking raids, but the Jarl never tried anything after this, most likely because of the truce he had made with Macbeth. You may have noticed that Macbeth was an apparent no-show for these battles. This was odd. Once Duncan became High King of Scotland, the Mormaer of Murray swore loyalty to him. This meant he was obligated to support him in battle, any battle, if the king asked him to. Macbeth, as Mormaer of one of Scotland's northernmost and most powerful provinces, was close to the battlefield next door. Macbeth's skills would also have been an asset. He had had a lot of experience keeping Vikings at bay. It stands to reason that Duncan would have called on him to join him in battle. Perhaps Duncan didn't call on him. Perhaps the saga tellers didn't know Macbeth and simply didn't mention him. However, it is more likely, considering what happened next, that Macbeth was quite aware that Duncan's military skills were noticeably lacking and declined to participate in a lost and dishonorable battle against their cousin. He could have had an ulterior motive, though. If Duncan had died in battle, the crown was his to take without getting any blood on his hands. At the very least, a weakened Duncan would sooner or later give him the opportunity to seize the throne. Magnus, the ten-year-old illegitimate son of the saint King Olaf the Stout of Norway, had been exiled to Russia, but in the spring of 1035, a delegation of Norwegians asked him to return as King of Norway. The moment Magnus set foot on Norwegian soil, Canute's empire lost Norway. But Canute did nothing to get it back. Perhaps the king had been ill. Perhaps the church didn't want him to fight the son of a saint. More likely, he just didn't have the time. He secured the southern frontier in case the Norwegians tried anything. He also strengthened ties with the Holy Roman Empire and arranged a marriage for his daughter Gunhild with the future emperor, Henry III. Either way, his time ran out. On November 12, 1035, King Canute died in Shaftesbury after a long and serious illness. It was possibly jaundice. He was 40 years old. England descended into chaos. Who would be the next king? Two women who bore his children unleashed an epic fight. They each had a son with a claim to the throne, and each had a part of the country to back their play. Queen Emma's son, Hartha Canute, had support in the south with Earl Godwin of Wessex and the House Carls, but he was currently in charge of Denmark. Elf Gifu's son, Harold Harefoot, was backed by the Dane law, and he was in England. Canute had issued an edict that Hartha Canute was to become King of England, but he couldn't get to England to accept the crown, because Magnus, the King of Norway, was about to make a move on Denmark. Thirteen days after Canute's death, the Witten gathered at Oxford. At the meeting, the northern magnates, led by Leofric, Earl of Mercia, and the Danes in London, chose Harold to hold all England. But Earl Godwin of Wessex supported Hartha Canute. In the end, an agreement was made that Harold would rule in the north of the kingdom, and Queen Emma and Earl Godwin would rule in the south on Hartha Canute's behalf. Harold now cut Emma off from her possessions at Winchester, and she became more isolated. And then... The Athelings returned. Edward and his brother Alfred, the sons of King Ethelred and Queen Emma. They may have wanted to use the succession crisis to their advantage, or they had been invited back by their mother. She had lost her possessions and was desperate for new allies. There was a letter with evidence for the latter. Edward and Alfred arrived separately. Edward sailed with 40 ships to Southampton, won a military victory there, but when faced with a superior English force, he quickly returned to Normandy. Alfred went to Dover via Flanders and tried to reach Emma in Winchester. Apparently, Godwin received Alfred and his men peacefully, only to hand them over to Harold Harefoot. 
Alfred was tied up and taken to Eli, where, as soon as he arrived, he was blinded on the ship, and thus blind was brought to the monks. Alfred's mutilation caused his death the following year, on February 5th, 1037. In the new year, Harthacanut still hadn't made it to England, and now everyone proclaimed Harold Harefoot king of all. That winter, Emma was exiled to Bruges, probably because she had invited Edward and Alfred over and no one trusted her. She lived at the court of Boudouin V, the Count of Flanders. Edward visited her in Bruges, but was unable to help his mother. She turned to her other son, Harthacanut. Duncan not only had issues in the north, the new King of Scotland also had a southern problem. To the south, Scotland and Anglo-Danish Northumbria were fighting for control of Cumbria. In 1039, the Earl of Northumbria, Edwulf, being exalted with pride, ravaged the Britons with sufficient ferocity and attempted to assert Northumbrian control over Cumbria. Apparently, he gained some of the land at least. King Duncan then led a Scottish raid on Durham in Northumbria. Perhaps he was out for revenge. Perhaps he wanted to restore his military reputation, which had suffered after his losses against the Orkney Vikings. Perhaps he wanted to distract from the fact that he was a really bad king. Alternately, he could have also wanted to copy King Malcolm's great victory at Carham in 1018, when Lothian was annexed to Scotland. It is also possible he just wanted to get his little paws on the treasures held in this major ecclesiastical site. Durham was the cult center of St. Cuthbert. No matter the reasons, Duncan's adventure had no strategic objective. Durham was far too deep in foreign territory for the Scottish king to have any hopes of holding it, and controlling Durham did nothing to secure Scottish borders. Durham was extremely difficult to capture. Duncan's grandfather had tried and failed to take it in 1006. The siege on Durham is undated, but it was either in 1039 or early 1040. History repeated itself. Duncan, King of the Scots, advanced with countless multitude of troops and laid siege to Durham and made strenuous but ineffective efforts to carry it. For a large proportion of his cavalry was slain by the besieged and he was put to a disorderly flight in which he lost all his foot soldiers, whose heads were collected in the marketplace and hung up upon posts. Duncan survived, but he was mad. Apparently, War King Macbeth once again had failed to show up for battle. That would not stand. England was suffering one disaster after another. In 1039, the Welsh attacked and killed several merchant lords. There was a great wind which scattered destruction over the land, and five bishops died, one after the other. The people blamed King Harold because he behaved in an unkingly and unchristian way. The moment Harthacanut found out that Harold had seized the throne of England, he ended the war with King Magnus. The two young kings became sworn brothers and agreed that if one of them died leaving no heirs, the other would succeed him. Harthacanut was now free to go over and claim the English throne. He first joined his mother Emma in Bruges with a small force, but he waited until spring to act. But before winter was over, King Harold died at Oxford. Messengers from England arrived in Bruges to summon Harthacanut, thinking that they were acting wisely. Harthacanut negotiated terms for his return, but waited two more months before heading for England with 60 ships. He brought Emma along, and she resumed her position at the center of affairs in England. Harthacanut was crowned June 18, 1040, and Oxford became his residential city. But the death of Edward's brother Alfred was not simply forgiven, and an unrest was brewing. Everyone tried to wash their hands of Alfred's blinding and subsequent death. Emma said that she had not asked her sons to come to England in 1036, and the letter claiming that was a forgery. Earl Godwin quickly swore an oath that he had not wanted Alfred to be blinded, and that he had only acted on the orders of King Harold. Harthacanut himself, remembering the injuries which his predecessor King Harold, who was considered his brother, had perpetrated against both him and his mother, ordered that Harold's body be exhumed and thrown into a fen. Harthacanut was no better king than Harold, though. He did nothing king-like. Those who had asked him to come over had buyer's remorse. All who wanted him before were ill-disposed toward him. And also, he did nothing worthy of a king as long as he ruled. 
So the new King of England was a violent, ambitious little brat who believed power was sweet, but revenge sweeter. King Duncan had a new enemy to march on, and he was in Scotland, Macbeth. Though Macbeth was a warlord, there are no records of him being considered one. Yet, like his father, he was probably also fighting Orkney Vikings led by Thorfinn's half-brothers constantly. We don't know what he or anyone looked like. The description of Macbeth is confusing. The red, tall, golden-haired one, he will be pleasant to men among them. Scotland will be brimful west and east during the reign of the furious red one. A red one usually means the color of someone's hair, but he is described as stately yellow-haired company. He probably had a ruddy complexion, perhaps a weather-beaten appearance or a skin condition. The furious red one might also describe his actions in battle, like a battle frenzy. Or this is all BS and he wasn't tall, blonde and red-faced. All these words describe their powerful, violent and handsome man at the time. It is not clear why Duncan moved north at this point in time. Some said that Duncan was too trusting, even naive, neither taking action against or protecting himself from certain members of an ancient family of conspirators who were said to have conspired to kill the king just as they conspired to kill his grandfather, his predecessor. The head of this family was Macbeth. It is possible that Macbeth was plotting a rebellion. After two defeats, Scotland looked pretty weak now. The wolf-like territory surrounding it were ready to pounce, and something had to be done. Another Mormare, perhaps Thorfinn, appeared to have backed Macbeth's play. In return for his support, Macbeth may have promised his cousin he could keep Caithness, maybe even Sutherland and Ross. Macbeth probably felt Duncan sucked egg as a king, and he had the right by blood to use force to remove him from power. He had a double claim because his wife was also of royal blood, as was his adopted son. Many nobles from both sides of the families would back him. The king was clearly not fit to rule, and Macbeth could prove it by provoking him to battle, like in the old days in the Tanistry system. He may have been jealous, felt angry about being cut out from the lineage by his grandfather, or just extremely ambitious, or all of it, or none of it. Did Lady Macbeth play a part in this revolt? It is possible. She would have wanted to become queen, if only to ensure her son would one day be king. She too had been cut out of the royal succession line, but Macbeth had been waiting for an opportunity to remove Duncan from power for five years, but now the king was on his doorstep. Not long after Duncan's return from his siege on Durham, on August 15,040, the king showed up in Pitgaveny, two miles northeast of Elgin. King Duncan's army fought a battle, but then Macbeth showed up with his full army the next day. Duncan, King of Scots, was killed in the autumn of the 19th day before the Calends of September by his Dux, Macbeth, son of Findlach. Dux, or Duke, is a late Roman title for high-ranking military officers, and its use survived into the post-Roman period. But Macbeth was no Duke. The chroniclers were confused. Again. Duncan was fatally wounded at Bothgothlin, or Hut of the Blacksmith, and carried to Elgin, where he died. In 1040, the Annals of Ulster announced Donghed, son of Crinan, king of Alaba, was killed by his own people. The Annals of Terni reported Duncan was killed at an immature age. They meant that he died prematurely. He was only 39 years old. The Chronicle of Melrose stated, by Macbeth, the son of Finlach, he was struck down. The mortally wounded king died in Elgin. Marianne Scotus wrote, Duncan, the king of Scotland, was killed in the autumn by his earl, Macbeth, Finlach's son. Duncan had reigned for five years, from the Mass of St. Andrew to the Nativity of St. Mary, celebrated by the Scots on August 16th. Canute had made Seward Bjornsson, a Dane, the Dukes or Earl of York sometime before 1033. Seward wanted more. He met with King Hartha Canute, who promised to give him the first important position that became available in his realm. On his way back, Seward ran into the Danish Earl of Huntingdon, Tosti, on a bridge. The king hated him because he had married Earl Godwin's daughter, 
tossed his step with his dirty feet on Stuart's mantle, for at that time it was fashionable to wear a mantle without any cord by which to hold it up. Stuart wanted to strike him dead right then and there, but he stopped himself because the shame was inflicted upon him by one who was on his way to the king's hall. He waited for Tosti to return from his visit from the king. Then he drew his sword and hacked off Tosti's head and went with it under his mantle back to the king's hall. There he asked, according to his promise, to give him the earldom of Huntingdon. But as the Earl had just left him, the King thought he was only joking. Then Seward related his deed and cast the head down before the King's feet. The King then kept his promise and proclaimed him at once Earl of Huntingdon. A few days later, the Northmen began to attack the realm. The King then was in a state of uncertainty and deliberated with the great men of his realm as to what means should be adopted. And they made over with one voice Northumberland, Cumberland and Westmoreland to Earl Seward and the king invested him with earldom over them. Either before or after this event, Seward secured his position by marrying into the Northumbrian aristocracy. He married Alfled, daughter of Edwulf II of Bambra, Earl of Northumbria, granddaughter of Uhtred the Bold. Seward attacked and killed Edwulf. Seward's attack was perhaps encouraged by a monarch wishing to crush a rebellious or disloyal vessel, but Seward probably just wanted to become the Earl of the whole of Northumbria, not just the districts he'd been given. Murdering Duncan didn't make Macbeth a king. He needed to haul ass and get to Schoon to undergo the traditional ceremony. Macbeth sat on the Stone of Destiny, the coronation stone, housed in a simple throne at Moot Hill. This was the only way he could be inaugurated as King of Scotland. It would ensure his possession of the crown and stop any rivals from challenging him in the future. Scotland's most senior nobles and clerics recited Macbeth's genealogy through his grandfather and the long lineage of early Scottish kings all the way to the mythological ancestors of the Scots. He was then presented with a sword to protect his people, and all the nobles hailed him King of Scotland. He received support from important members in the nobility, unspoken support from nobles who wanted to end Duncan's reign, and active support from Macbeth's own followers, including contacts he had made while he was raised at Malcolm's court. Duncan had been unpopular. He was seen as weak, oppressive or unrighteous. His poor performance on the battlefield lost him the backing of other nobles with an interest in the crown. Perhaps people considered Macbeth a much more effective, bold and decisive leader, though people were more likely just anti-Duncan and not pro-Macbeth. And people apparently felt that the Tanistry system was still on, or back on. There was no civil war, no open resistance to his reign at this time, and Macbeth didn't assassinate any rivals. Thorfinn was his only rival and he never acted on it, perhaps because he wanted to keep the peace and he was plenty busy back home. Another possible rival was Duncan's brother Moldred, who had succeeded Duncan as king in Cumbria, but he had disappeared from the history books. Future opponents were Duncan's children with Southern, sister to Seward of Northumbria, Malcolm Canmore, or Malcolm Big Chief, and Domnolban, or Donald. They were born when King Malcolm II was still alive, so Donald was at least six or seven years old. Malcolm was at least ten. Duncan's eldest son was now King of Cumbria, and he did proclaim himself King of Scotland, but very few, if any, backed him. Macbeth was well aware that Duncan's kids were going to be a future threat, but since they were kids, they were untouchable, until they could lift a sword in their defense. The Duff family and Macduff from the Shakespeare play may have existed, but there is no evidence he opposed Macbeth. There is, however, evidence that the family lost property during Macbeth's reign, and the only one who could take property away was the king. So something was probably going on. Duncan's relatives could become problematic. The center of the opposition was in Dunkeld, where the Mormare of Ethel Crinan lived, Duncan's father, but he laid low for now. For some reason, Macbeth did not remove him from power and didn't replace him with his own appointees. He was either magnanimous, didn't have a lot of influence over the church, or he didn't think the man posed a serious threat. King Hartha Canut collapsed during the wedding of one of his henchmen. He died soon after, not because he had been partying too hard, but because he had been ill. He had no heirs. There were three possible candidates for the throne of Alfred, all sons of men deeply wronged by Canute. 
Magnus the Good, now King of Denmark and Norway, was Hartha Knut's heir by oath and adoption. Swain, the son of Knut's sister Estrid, was the nearest male relative and the ranking member of the Danish house. He was English by birth and his aunt was Earl Godwin's wife. And there was Edward, son of the late King Athelred Unred, a direct descendant from the house of Alfred the Great. He kind of represented the soul of England. The crown reverted back to the Saxons. And before the king was buried, all the folk chose Edward to be king in London, as was his natural right. Edward had the support from the government and all the nobles in England, but he couldn't rely on anyone. He hadn't been in the country long enough to establish a power base. His mother was politically a hot mess, though she certainly tried to keep herself relevant even after Hartha Canute's death. Edward's position was uncertain. Magnus threatened to invade the country to restore the full empire established under Canute, and Count Baldwin V of Flanders allowed English exiles to hang out and regroup to return to England with a vengeance. On April 3, 1043, Edward the Confessor was finally crowned King of England on Easter at Winchester. Easter was a time of resurrection, and Edward had now resurrected the ancient Alfred the Great line. With the accession of Edward, the Viking Empire of the North officially ended. Naturally, Edward wanted trusted people around him. The majority of his household were Canute's people, but he removed bad apples. He had brought men from Normandy, with whom he enriched with many honors, and made him his privy councillors and administrators of the royal palace. King Edward flexed his military muscle on an international scale numerous times, taking command of a fleet of ships and made displays of military might. Edward's very first act was to deal with his treacherous mom and her supporters. But to get rid of her, he needed the support of the three leading earls, Leofric of Northwest Midlands, Godwin of Wessex, and Seward of Northumbria. On the 16th of November, 1043, King Edward and his earls marched on Emma and seized her huge treasury. Edward accused Emma of treason and kicked out Stigand, Bishop of Elmham, because he was closest to his mother's council. But none of these earls were Edward's appointees. Seward appeared to have been his supporter, but Godwin was problematic. He was Canute's creature, had been involved in his brother's death, and his wife was part of the Danish elite. As Earl of Wessex, the heart of the English kingdom, Godwin was very influential, the highest-ranking secular official. Godwin did want to get in the king's good graces, though. For one, he gifted him a great ship to show support for him and to apologize for the death of his brother. A few years later, Edward married Edith, Godwin's daughter, famous and distinguished for verse and prose and in her needlework and painting. Another Minerva, the Roman goddess of craft and wisdom, among other things. Edward agreed all the more readily to contract this marriage, because he knew that with the advice and help of that Godwin, he would have a firmer hold on his hereditary rights in England. For two years, Duncan's family tried to get support to install Malcolm as the legitimate heir to the throne of Scotland. Then they fled, since it was abundantly clear that death rather than life awaited them if they had remained. Donald and Malcolm first made their way to Thorfinn's court up north, but the boys couldn't stay there, probably because of Thorfinn's pact with Macbeth. The king might come and find them there and ruin whatever peace he and Thorfinn had made. Donald went to Ireland, and Malcolm escaped to his kingdom, Cumbria. From there, he joined his uncle in Northumbria. Wishing to follow the advice of Earl Seward and all his actions there, Malcolm made his way to him, and acting immediately on his advice, and under his escort, he sought an audience with King Edward, and was gladly admitted to his friendship and the assistance he had promised. As Edward, the once king in exile himself, knew that Malcolm had been unjustly deprived of the dignity of king, he gladly welcomed him to his allegiance and special service. It is not clear what Malcolm did or didn't do at Edward's court. If he wanted to secure England's support when he went after the throne of Scotland, he must have sworn some kind of loyalty to Edward. Edward granted Malcolm the rich manor of Corby in Northamptonshire. Both Edward and Seward were thrilled to help little Malcolm out, both wanted to get a foothold in Scotland. If they raised him right and helped him to get the crown, they'd have a puppet king. Macbeth's reign was considered by some to be one of tyranny, by others one of prosperity. There is proof of prosperity. Of tyranny, not so much. 
Macbeth was a religious man, like everyone else at the time. The church in Rome was strengthening its grip on every kingdom it could. A customary priest was at Macbeth's court to make sure Rome's guidelines were in line with the country's policies. Macbeth and his wife Gruach, in a manner sacred to splendid infamy, donated lands to various religious communities. Agriculture formed the economic basis of 11th century Scotland, arable land was the basis of political power, and land was an important source of income in the form of rents and sales of produce. The surplus of beer, oats and rye gave wealth to the king, Mormare and church. The crown granted most monastic lands, and the gifts were listed in the monastery's donation books. A grant of land, the villa of Bolgain made by Macbeth to the Hermits of Loch Leven, with utmost veneration and devotion. Macbeth and Gruach also granted the villa of Kirkness to the Chaldees. The Celdi, servants of God, were a monastic movement that believed that the Vikings had arrived because of society's bad morals. Kirkness was given with motives of piety and the benefit of their prayers. The rent from this land was probably used to finance a chantry priest who celebrated mass and prayed for the benefactor's soul at a specifically dedicated altar in either the church or St. Serf's monastery. Some people think Macbeth granted this land as a way to pay off his guilt. Others think this proves Macbeth was a devout man. But it was perfectly normal behavior. He did what all kings in 11th century Scotland did. There is no indication that he was anything more than a fairly common Christian king. Duncan's father, Crinan, didn't act out for five whole years. He probably didn't have support and had to bide his time. Or he may have simply waited for foreign assistance in the form of Earl Seward, uncle to his grandkids. But then, in 1045, his anger about his son's death erupted in an open revolt. Crinan had plenty of resources to organize a big rebellion. A battle was fought between the Scots on one road and Crinan, abbot of Dunkeld, was killed in it. And many along with him, namely nine score fighting men. This battle was the first indication of unrest during Macbeth's reign. There were many casualties on both sides. It must have been a spectacular fight. 180 rebels, including Crinan, ended up dead. The revolt's leader was killed, but the unrest wasn't over. The second problem came roaring around the corner, when, at about the same time, Earl Seward came to Scotland with a great army and expelled King Macbeth and appointed another. Malcolm Canmore would have been too young to be the appointee, and we don't know who Seward installed. But Seward just grabbed Lothian, not the whole of Scotland. In 1018, Lothian had been annexed to Scotland by Macbeth's grandfather, Malcolm II. The Earl probably wanted it back, secure the northern border, or be able to collect rent from the land as payment for him taking care of Malcolm. It's not clear if Seward coordinated the attack with Duncan's family, but if he did, it would explain why Macbeth lost Lothian for a short while. The King of Scotland was too busy putting down Crinan's revolt. Officially, the dates are a year apart. And then, after Seward's departure, Macbeth recovered the kingdom. Seward backed down and didn't return for a long while. It was clear to everyone, in putting down a revolt, killing the ringleader of a rebellion and fighting back the English, that Macbeth was simply too powerful. In fact, he was so powerful that he dared to venture a trip abroad. In an act of piety and devotion, Macbeth went on a pilgrimage to Rome. A pilgrimage is an act of public penance for sins committed and a quest for absolution from those sins. Rome, the Holy See and cult center of Saints Peter and Paul, was one of the three great pilgrimage centers of medieval Christendom, second only to Jerusalem. Some say Macbeth was seeking papal absolution for murdering Duncan. But getting absolutions was not the most common reason for royalty to go on a pilgrimage at this time. It was the new millennium and the 1,000-year anniversary of Christ's death. People also believed the second coming was upon them, and perhaps Macbeth wanted to be in Rome for the main event. Macbeth may also have been inspired by Canute's spectacular tales of his successful pilgrimage. He would have heard about them during their submission meeting in 1027. 
Thorfinn had already gone before him and got an audience with the Pope and received absolution from him for all his sins. But apart from the spiritual journey, the trip definitely had a political dimension. When a Pope gave someone consideration and honor, it raised his social status. For kings, the rewards were even greater. Kings hoped for a divine sanction for their office, authority and succession. Macbeth felt safe enough to leave Scotland for months. He must have had a solid control over the country and not feared any attacks from anywhere. Macbeth probably exchanged hostages with Thorfinn, so that there would be no funny business while he was away. Macbeth took the long and hazardous journey to the Eternal City. Not every king returned from such a trip. If he went the traditional route through England, he could have been killed by the Saxons. Malcolm Canmore was in exile there, with Edward the Confessor. But there are no records of him entering England and he probably took a different route or traveled incognito. He may have entered Europe through northern France or the Low Countries, then up the Rhine to Switzerland, through the Alpine passes into northern Italy. He could have used the network of hostels on the continent used for the relief of Irish pilgrims on their way to Rome. Although, as king, he was probably received at higher status places and stayed with local kings and bishops. He traveled with a retinue to serve him and protect him from robbers. We don't know if Guruch came along. It was unusual, but not unheard of. Most pilgrims arrived in Rome for the great festivals of the Christian calendar when the Eternal City was chock full with worshippers. To ensure maximum publicity for his opulent entrance, Macbeth would have timed his arrival, probably around Easter 1050. Some Scottish historians even deny he went, but Mariana Scotus, an Irish monk, wrote the following in his meticulously kept journal. Macbethat Romae Argentum Pauberibus Seminando Distribuit. King of Scots Macbeth scattered silver like sea to the poor in Rome. Macbeth was a king of a small kingdom on the fringes of Europe, but he gave as much as other royal pilgrims and his visit was recorded because of its religious significance. His act of charity was directed to a wider and more influential audience. He was trying to impress other high-ranking pilgrims, the ecclesiastical authorities in Rome and perhaps the Pope himself. He was not there to bribe either the papal court or the Pope, though. Like Canute, he may have just wanted to debunk the misconception that he was from a remote, poor and backward nation. This was public relations, medieval style. Pope Leo only spent six months of his five-year reign in Rome. If Macbeth met him, which was likely, he wasn't in Rome. There is no evidence Macbeth was anointed. Meanwhile, there was trouble in England. King Edward realized that marrying into the powerful family of the Godwins wasn't all that it was cracked up to be. He started listening less and less to Godwin and more and more to a new political Norman faction led by Robert de Jumiège. The Godwins had been overstepping their boundaries more than once and needed to be reined in. Some say Robert influenced the king in making decisions and how, through his assiduous communication with him, the king began to neglect more useful advice. Edward enlisted the help of the French to build new castles in a continental style in Godwin's area, and whenever office holders died, they were replaced by these strangers. And when Ed Siege, the Archbishop of Canterbury, died, the church elected one of Godwin's family members. Edward appointed Jumiège instead. When Edward's brother-in-law, Eustace de Bologne, ended up fighting with Godwin, Edward sided with Eustace and he mobilized his earls, Seward, Leofric and Ralph the Timid. The country was on the edge of a civil war. Members of the Witan advised that evil doing should cease on both sides. Godwin's eldest son was already outlawed and Godwin and his other son Harold were summoned. Godwin asked for safe passage twice to talk to the king and for an exchange of hostages to guarantee good behavior on both sides. But Edward didn't want that. He was sent a message that he could hope for the king's peace when and only when he gave him back his brother alive. In the end, Godwin and all his sons were outlawed by Edward and his counselors. Godwin fled in the middle of the night to Count Baldwin's court in Bruges. Godwin's daughter and Edward's wife Edith was taken from the royal court to the nunnery. The King of England also started divorce proceedings. These were later suspended. Earl Godwin tried to return late June 1052, but a storm forced him to return to Bruges. The English tried to assemble a naval force in London. 
When this failed, Godwin and his sons returned and began to ravage various parts of southern England and the Isle of Wight. They seized ships for themselves and as many hostages as they wished. On September 14, 1052, the Godwins arrived in London and drummed up local support. Edward and his earls were ready to meet the threat of the Godwins with a fleet of about 50 ships and a land force. Both sides arrayed for battle. Godwin and Harold sent messengers to the king asking to be returned to power. Certain influential members in the king's entourage, Earl Seward and Leofric among them, urged a peaceful reconciliation, once again reminding those present of the dangers of civil war and England's vulnerability to invasion. Edward appeared of passionate temper and of prompt and vigorous action, and, when accepting the Godwins back a day later, as having to calm the boiling tumult of his mind. The king granted the Earl and his children his full friendship and full status as an Earl, and all that he had had. Edith came back at the royal court to take her position as queen in the king's bedchamber, but their childlessness became a problem. The Godwins then forced Edward to outlaw the French, who had promoted injustices and passed unjust judgments and given bad counsel in this country. Although most Normans went to Normandy, some fled west to the castle of Osborne Pentecost. Then, Osborne and his ally Hugo surrendered their castles and went to Scotland and were there kindly received by Macbeth, King of Scots. It was the earliest recorded Norman presence in Scotland. Macbeth wasn't just being hospitable, he needed their expertise. He knew trouble was coming his way. Malcolm Canmore was just about old enough to attack him. By 1054, Malcolm Canmore was in his 20s, old enough to reclaim the crown and become King of Scotland. Malcolm strategically married Ingeborg, Thorfinn's daughter. His education and upbringing had been English, and he had been exposed to the concept of the divine rights of kings reinforced by the Roman Catholic Church. Malcolm couldn't undertake any military action by himself. He had no army, no money, and no power. He needed help. Malcolm went into the presence of King Edward at the earliest opportunity, humbly petitioning him that he would graciously deign to permit certain of the nobles of England, who were willing of their own accord to set out with him for Scotland, to win back his kingdom. The king kindly gave his immediate assent to this request and granted full license to anyone who wished. Moreover, he graciously promised that he himself would come to his aid with his military might, if it were necessary. Malcolm had no intention of getting too much help from the English, but by asking Edward formally for assistance showed he was five steps ahead of the game. He had to consider his relationship with the English crown once he became King of the Scots, but too much English involvement could mean that he would simply become a vassal king, or worse, a mere puppet king. He needed to keep the English involvement in the military campaign down to a bare minimum. Of all the English lords willing to help, Malcolm only accepted assistance from Seward, the Earl of Northumbria, his uncle. The Anglo-Danish forces consisted of an army of cavalry and a powerful fleet. By the standards of the day, the invading force was huge. There is no record which routes these two armies took, but it would have been strategic, and probably similar to those followed by invading armies of Roman times. Wintoon said, Then with them from Northumberland, this Malcolm entered Scotland and passed over Forth Down, straight to Tay, up that water the highway, then to Burnham to gather hall, where they bade and took counsel. In July of 1054, the fleet landed at Dundee and took possession of the town. They also seized the contents of a couple of merchant ships that had just arrived. The cavalry joined up with the fleets at the plains of Gowrie, west of Dundee. They probably went right past Scone, the Scottish capital. They were likely pillaging the area, trying to get Macbeth to come out and play. The king didn't take the bait. Perhaps Macbeth was not at home, or the Northumbrians quietly snuck past the stronghold. Most likely, Macbeth rode out to the country to muster forces so he could fight such a huge invasion. The Anglo-Danes were there to kill Macbeth, take Malcolm to Scone, and install him as king. But the king's army once mustered was nearby and strong. Malcolm and Seward had no choice but to duke it out on the battlefield. It was not simply English versus Scots, though. Macbeth had the assistance of the highly experienced Normans who had recently been kicked out of England. 
Malcolm had Northumbrian forces, his Scottish supporters, but he had also been given Edward's house carls, the King of England's elite troops. Edward was personally committed to and actively supported Seward's invasion. There were even claims that Seward invaded Scotland at the King's command. On July 27, 1054, it all turned into a very large and bloody single battle, but the exact site of the battle is unknown. People said it was Dunsinan, but that location was added later. The duo had lost the element of surprise, and the effectiveness of their army was degraded by having to join battle immediately after a forced march of at least 125 miles. Macbeth's army, fighting on familiar terrain and prepared for the Northumbrian advance, was able to inflict heavy casualties. But the Scots were an irresolute and fickle race of men, better in woods than on the plain, and trusting more to flight than to manly boldness in battle. Macbeth and his army was put to flight, but the king escaped. The Northumbrian losses were heavy, and Malcolm only partially recovered Scotland. Earl Seward travelled forth from a great raiding army into Scotland, both with the raiding ship army and with raiding land army, and fought against the Scots, and put to flight the King Macbeth, and killed all that was best there in the land, and led away from there such a great war booty as no man had ever got before, but his son Osborne, and his sister's son Seward, and some of his house carls, and also the kings were killed there on the day of the Seven Sleepers. The dead on the Anglo-Northumbrian side included Dolphin, probably a supporter or Malcolm's relative, Seward's nephew, also called Seward, and the Earl's son, Osborne. When Seward heard about this news, he inquired, was his death wound received before or behind? The messenger replied, before. Then said he, I greatly rejoiced, no other death was fitting either for him or me. On Macbeth's side, Osborne, Pentecost and Hugo, who had sought refuge at Macbeth's court two years earlier, were killed while fighting for their new lord. The Battle of the Seven Sleepers put Canmore in firm control of the Lowlands. The English were like, we're good. They made a separate peace with Macbeth and returned to England, laden with loot. Malcolm was left with only his own forces. While in York, Seward became very ill. Seward, the stalwart earl, being stricken by dysentery, felt that death was near and said, How shameful is it that I, who could not die in so many battles, should have been saved for the ignominious death of a cow. At least clothe me in my impenetrable breastplate, gird me with my sword, place my helmet on my head, my shield in my left hand, my gilded battle axe in my right, that I, the bravest of soldiers, may die like a soldier. He spoke, and armed as he had requested, gave up his spirit with honor. Macbeth was losing his grip on the Scottish crown now that Scotland was split in two. Macbeth, perceiving that his might was diminishing daily while Malcolm's was increasing, suddenly left the southern regions and made for the north, where he thought he could defend himself more securely in the narrow valleys and the hidden depths of the forest. Macbeth was not on the run, but he had withdrawn beyond the mouth into his Murray vastness. Here he could regroup and come up with a plan to hold on to his crown. Malcolm didn't pursue him and was unable to exploit his victory for more territorial gains. Malcolm's realm was restricted to southern Scotland, Lothian, Cumbria, and Strathclyde. Malcolm's power may have stretched further north, perhaps all the way to the mouth. Either way, he was not in a great strategic position to launch an attack to regain the rest of Scotland above the Firth Clyde line. He also had a few other priorities. He had to strengthen his hold over southern Scotland and establish the legitimacy of his rule there. This was important because Macbeth's survival and retention of the North cast doubt on Malcolm's kingship. Malcolm had a trump card. He was in the political and historic heartland of the Scottish Kingdom and Scone. Most believe Seward inaugurated him after the battle, according to the traditional practice to prove once and for all that he was the rightful King of Scots. But the historians had a meeting and decided that he was not yet king. Two kings of Scotland at once was too complicated. For Malcolm to truly become the fully recognized king of all of Scotland, Macbeth had to die. Malcolm Canmore bided his time. He remembered how his father had set foot past the south of the mouth and died. He was about to repeat the same mistake. 
Meanwhile, Macbeth didn't cower in the security of his royal centers on the Murray Firth. All the while, the king engaged in guerrilla warfare and raided the land south of the Mount. He would attack, gather loot, and retreat into Murray. He didn't fear the lowlanders would follow him into the highlands. In 1057, Macbeth was once again close to the southern limit of his territory. He performed another raid, or was in the middle of a larger attack to get his kingdom back. Malcolm was waiting for him and chased him back into Murray with a so-called running battle. Macbeth made a last stand outside Lumfanon. Lumfanon lies only three miles north of the principal pass through the mouth. Malcolm, by a quick march, unexpectedly pursued Macbeth over the mountains and as far as Lumfanon, and there suddenly intercepted him with a light skirmish and killed him along with the few who resisted. For all the people that Macbeth led out to battle knew full well that Malcolm was their true lord. Therefore, they refused to fight a battle against him and deserted the field of battle at the first sound of trumpets. Macbeth was slain in battle and died a warrior's death on the same Mass of St. Mary that Duncan died, August 16, 1057, 17 years to the day. He was about 52 years old. Perhaps the customary beheading took place and Macbeth's head was mounted on a spear tip for the benefit of Malcolm and displayed to the victorious survivors, but we don't know. Initially, Macbeth was buried under a pile of rocks now called Macbeth's Cairn, but he's not there now. Meaning that soon after, he was probably moved to Iona, the common sepulchre for many centuries of Scottish kings. But in case you didn't catch this little bit of irony, the saying was still true. Macbeth, the High King of Scotland, had set foot past the south of the mouth and not lived. After Macbeth's death, his adopted son Lulach seized power. Lulach, who was about 25 years old, was probably more mayor of Murray and was Macbeth's tenais. However, he claimed the throne as the nephew of the son of Boyd. Immediately after the death of Macbeth, certain members of his family took his kinsman Lulach to Schoon, placed him on the royal throne and made him king. No one, however, wished to obey him or to have any part in what they had done. As a member of both royal houses, he would have had support, but he was probably king in name only. He wouldn't have been in Schoon either. That was deep in Malcolm's territory. His kingdom was what Macbeth had left behind, basically Murray. He wasn't much of a king and probably didn't even want to become one. He didn't seem to have had a military bone in his body. As the Mormare of Murray, he never teamed up with his father to take on Malcolm. He was quickly installed to fill the power vacuum. He was referred to as Lulach the Fool, Fatus, and that's all you need to know. Malcolm Canmore didn't set out to take over Murray immediately. It was winter time, and a campaign into the Highlands would have failed. He let the kid be until springtime. Then Malcolm sent out his thanes in all directions to track him down, but for four months their efforts were expended in vain, until, as they were searching in the higher regions, Lulach was found in Essi, Strathbogie. Strathbogie was of great strategic significance. It was a major route into Murray through the mouth. The unfortunate Lulach was king for three months. He fell by the arms of the same Malcolm. The man met his fate at Essi in Strathbogie. Thus, alas, through lack of caution, the hapless king perished. Lack of caution means he was surprised, tricked, or betrayed by Malcolm. Lulach had the honor of having the shortest reign of any Scottish king before or since. Lulach reigned from the Nativity of St. Mary to the Mass of St. Patrick, which meant he reigned from August 16, 1057 to March 17, 1058, a whopping seven months. His body was buried along with that of Macbeth on Iona. Murray remained a moormeership, and the Scottish High Kings were still not welcome to step past the south of the Mount. Malcolm was crowned Malcolm III at Schoon, 25th of April, 1057. English medieval scholars claimed that Malcolm became King of Scots by gift of King Edward, and did homage to the English king, and Seward appointed Malcolm king, as King Edward had commanded. This claim had far-reaching consequences when in 1301, King Edward I, aka Longshanks, wrote a letter to Pope Boniface VIII and attempted to justify his claimed overlordship of Scotland by fabricating historical precedents. 
one of which was St. Edward, the King of England, gave the Kingdom of Scotland to Malcolm to be held of him. You may know King Edward I as the bad guy in the movie Braveheart. The Viking Age was drawing to a close. Scandinavians were no longer looking for new land, and the coastal defenses in Europe had gotten too strong for the pirates to make any headway. In the first week of January 1066, Edward the Confessor died in his early 50s. He had no heirs. Edward's half-Danish brother-in-law, Harold, son of Earl Godwin, was proclaimed as the new King of England. Some said Edward had picked him on his deathbed, while others said Edward had picked Edgar Atheling, the grandson of King Edmund Ironside, as his successor. Meanwhile, Edward's Norman cousin, William the Bastard, not only claimed that he had been promised a throne by the ailing Edward, but that Harold Godwinson had sworn on holy relics, no less, to make sure William got the crown. Harold Godwinson was a usurper and had broken an oath made before God. In September 1066, Harald defeated an invasion force led by Harald Hardrada, King of Norway. But three weeks later, faced a new invader. On October 14, 1066, Harald fought Duke William of Normandy at Hastings and famously lost his throne and his life. The great-great-grandson of the Viking leader Rolf the Walker, the man who had made a deal with the King of France to settle in Normandy, was named the Conqueror and became the new ruler of England. Let's see how the story of Macbeth got twisted until it landed on William Shakespeare's desk, shall we? Gaelic-speaking Scotland was always considered a threat to England. The threat grew throughout the centuries. Macbeth represented a scary Scotland that could come down and kick England's butt, and the chroniclers over the centuries went all out to drive this point home. In 1360, John of Forden published The Chronicle of the Scottish Nation, characterizing Macbeth as a murderer and a tyrant. In 1400, Andrew of Wintoun wrote his original Chronicle of Scotland, introducing three weird sisters to the Macbeth story. In 1527, Hector Boyce published his History and Chronicle of Scotland, introducing Banquo to the Macbeth story and describing Lady Macbeth as a power-hungry queen. And then, in 1577, Raphael Hollenshed published Chronicles of England, Scotland and Ireland, bringing it all together. William Shakespeare from Stratford-upon-Avon, England, had been writing poems and plays, but when his patron, Queen Elizabeth I, died in 1603, he had to get into the new king's good graces. This was King James VI of Scotland and King James I of England. When Shakespeare's company became the king's men, they had more opportunities to perform at the king's court. The bard wanted to flatter his new employer and wrote a play that would be sure to please the king. He had a few things to work with. First up, King James had a terrible attention span. The play had to be short by Shakespeare's standards. Secondly, James was really digging the supernatural. He believed witches were out to get him, and the king even wrote a book, Demonology. Third, Shakespeare should try to make sure that everyone saw him as the rightful heir to the throne of Scotland. There was a lot of suspicion in England toward the Scots, to put it mildly. And lastly, there was the very current attempt on the King of England's life with the infamous gunpowder plot. To the Protestant tutors, every Roman Catholic was considered a threat. Roman Catholic Spain was up to its neck in plots and conspiracies to get rid of Queen Elizabeth. When King James ascended the throne, he was relatively relaxed around the Roman Catholics. He was married to a closet one. He loosened their restrictions a bit, but when Roman Catholic plots were discovered against his person, he cracked down on them hard. Not everyone was willing to slink back to the shadows. Robert Catesby had suffered a lot for his beliefs. He gathered a bunch of conspirators to blow up Parliament House to kill the king and his family. They gathered a bunch of gunpowder barrels and assigned Guy Fox to light the fuse. Fox was an explosives expert who had served in the Spanish army during the Eighty Years' War in the Low Countries, which was in its 36th year. Others would kidnap King James's daughter, Princess Elizabeth, and install her as a puppet queen. But the plot was discovered, and during a search in the Westminster area, Guy Fawkes was found with the gunpowder and arrested. The remaining plotters hightailed it out of London, but were caught in a shootout at Holbesh House in Staffordshire. Catesby and others died from their wounds. Some were captured, while others managed to escape. 
The trial started in January 1606 and the conspirators were sentenced to death. In 1606, William Shakespeare wrote his tragedy of Macbeth. It's a pretty straightforward piece based on Raphael Hollinshed's book from 1577. It was a short play, by his standards. He used Wintoon's weird sisters and turned them into witches to please King James's love for the dark side. He used Boyce's Banquo as James's ancestor to show the world that he had a noble forebear from the Stuart line and legitimized his crown. And, unlike the ideas of Scotland during Macbeth's reign, he made trying to assassinate a king look like an evil thing to warn the audience that killing kings was wrong. The scheming Lady Macbeth was taken from another story in Hollinshed's history book about a different Celtic queen. All in all, great drama. TLDL, The Tragedy of Macbeth is a short, tension-filled, blood-soaked, somewhat supernatural play that legitimized the king's position and warned people not to kill kings or bad things happen. The first known performance of The Tragedy of Macbeth was in 1611. Some say that King James was not happy with the bloodshed in Macbeth, and the play wasn't performed again until 1703, nearly a century later. Over time, the play became very popular. Today, Every year, hundreds of thousands of people attend the performances of The Scottish Play, which is the name it got, because it is rumored to be cursed. If an actor says the name Macbeth while in the theater, the production will be cursed with poor production, injuries, and just bad luck. This is why actors will only refer to the play as The Scottish Play, or That Play. The history of the curse began on the night of its first performance, when a young boy who was to play the Lady Macbeth developed a fever and suddenly died. Shakespeare had to take over the role himself. On the night of its first performance in a hundred years, England had one of the worst storms in history. Other events occurred during later performances, real daggers being used instead of fake ones, crowds attacking the actors, and, in 1849, at the Astor Place Opera House in New York, a protest concerning a fight between an American and a British actors held outside escalated to a riot, killing 23 people and injuring hundreds. The curse continues to this day with sets falling down, fires breaking out, and actors getting injured. Perhaps the spirit of Macbeth at MacFinlech is mighty mad that people are messing with the pretty peaceful and grand legacy of him, the last of the great Gallic kings.